Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome once again to our meeting on Mondays, our Monday meetings. And uh, every second Monday of the month, we have our meeting, our meetings in English. And tonight is the second month of second Monday of March, getting close to spring now, and uh, a little less cold. It's always warm in here, so uh, it's a little less chilly than outside. And uh, so tonight, I'm going to be I'm going to be talking a little bit about the gospel according to spiritism in a few minutes. But before that, we're going to have Nancy here or Nancy, not Nancy Drew, but Nancy. <laughs> Nancy will be here to read a message for us from the book Our Daily Bread. Message 162, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, after that, I'm not gonna, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Gospel of to Spiritism, chapter 13, item number 17, about confession. And let's start with a, a little prayer. If you, if you feel free to close your eyes if you want to. Uh, if you're driving, don't close your eyes, please. Uh, if you're watching this in the car, don't, don't close your eyes. Um, so it is with gladness of the heart, with happiness in our souls, that we are here once again to study the gospel of God. And with this, we would like to ask him, ask our dear friends from the spiritual realm, ask our dear friend and brother Jesus to bless us with good thoughts, with good ears, but most importantly, bless our heart so that we can not only understand the message, but feel the message in order for that message to become part of who we are. So dear Jesus, we know that we are always asking something from you, but tonight our request is not only for us, but it is that your message, that whatever we hear tonight, may become something that we can use not only to improve ourselves, but also to make a difference in the world we live in. So bless us all tonight. Bless our families. Bless the ones that are far away from us, but close to our hearts, so that we can all be part of this big family of love, of hope and of compassion now and always so be it so with that said let's invite nancy Nancy, so that she can read a message for us Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. This message is the chapter one sixty two from the book Our Daily Bread. And the title is Spiritual Manifestations. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 
Paul, 1 Corinthians 12. With the revivification of pure Christianity in the spiritist groups with Jesus, the same preoccupation exists, which used to torture the students of the apostolic times with regards to mediumship. The majority of the workers involved in evangelization become anxious for the immediate development of their incipient faculty. In certain centers, they insist on an achievement superior to the possibility that they dispose of. In others, they dream of great phenomena. The problem, however, does not lay in the exterior existence. I will make a brief comment here. Um, what he is trying to say to us so far is for the beginners, if we are Adventists and we start to come to a spirit center and we see other meanings that they have more um, type of mediumship, like uh, mediums that can see, they can smell, they can hear, they have intuition, um, they heal people or whatever. So then um, we feel that uh, we wanted to be that way, we feel excited about it. But what he's saying here is, does not lay in the exterior acquisition. Because some people come um, to be famous and some people go to the Spirit Center to see that type of show, right, the presentation. This is not entertainment. It's mediumship. It's, it's another thing. So that's why uh, Emmanuel was saying to us to pay attention on this. Then he kept saying, let each individual enrich his own intimate illumination, intensifying his spiritual powers through knowledge and through love, and he will enter into the possession of eternal treasures in a natural way. Many students would like to be great, clairvoyant, or admirable prognosticators of the future motivated by the prospect of superiority. However, they do not even deign to meditate on the sweat of the sublime achievement. They are inclined toward profit, but do not reflect over the effort to achieve it. In that regard, it is interesting to recall that Simon Peter, whose spirit felt so happy to be with the glorious master in the table, talk about the situation he had with Jesus, was not able to withstand the anguish felt by his friend, flagellated in the Calvary. It is justifiable for the disciple to hope and seek a spiritual aggrandizement. However, whoever does have a humble spiritual faculty should not be unappreciated because a fellow student has a more expressive quality. This part remember, um, makes me to remember um, when we are, especially on these days, uh, when we are um, teenagers or we're very young and we go to the social media, media and we see other people so fancy with fancy clothes and having a very nice life. So we feel less than them. It's exactly what Emmanuel said. Every single person has your level. It depends on a lot of things. But you can get better, whatever the level of mediumship you have. If you study, if you make your effort, if you come to the 
Spirit Center. If you do your best, the only thing we can do is the best as we can, right? Let each person work with the material he was given. I think this sentence is the, the whole thing, the meaning is right here. Let, let each person work with the material he was given. Convinced that the Supreme Lord does not take part in the activities of the spiritual manifestations according to the human whims, but rather according to its general utility and usefulness. So, uh, like I said, we have to, to invest in ourselves and our native leadership. The study is, is very good idea to do it. You know, being here, like I said, it's another great idea. And I love in the other paragraph that he said, do it in a natural way. Don't try to force anything. And on the bottom, when he said, um, let, like I said before, let be the person who work with the material he was given. God gave to you what you can handle. Do the best you can with that virtue you got. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. And I am back. Thank you, Lucy, for for the message. And um, as I said, we are going to talk a little bit about a message from the book The Gospel According to Spiritism that we I usually say this that we are studying from beginning to end. We already did it once in English, but we actually what we did was we studied chapter by chapter. So we every and Monday, we would come here, start chapter one, then the next, chapter two, chapter three. So we went through all the chapters in general. Now, and it's been a little while because we're about to have the book. So we are going topic by topic, which allows us to go a little bit deeper into some of these, these topics. But even so, there is so much to talk about that... I usually say, and I usually recommend for for people to read the message when they after they get here, they they back, get back to their houses or their homes, because um, what I say here is not necessarily exactly what's inside the item. I read it, I interpret it, I get get some ideas, but sometimes there's so much to talk about that I only like pick up some of the ideas and then I talk a little bit about them. But there's so much more inside of these, all of these items that um, that it's important for us if we really want to under, understand or have, have a, a better understanding of the whole topic itself. And if we get interested by the topic that we read it so that we can have something more to uh, to understand and to, to think about. So, um, Having said that, we are in a part of each chapter. Let me do this. I, sometimes I do it so uh, we can um, we can understand how the gospel according to spiritism works or how Kardec divided it. So every chapter of the gospel according to spiritism, he starts the chapter by getting parts of the Bible. And then he gets a little bit of the Bible, and then he talks about that passage. So he writes some items about those topics. And then after he does that, 
or the major topic of the chapter, then he goes into, um, he grabs messages that were received by mediums at his time around Europe. And then he gets those messages and he gets, he puts the messages in the book. He separates these messages by topic or by subtopics. So, for example, last month when we came in to talk about uh, last month's topic was about beneficence. Then in this topic called beneficence, he had one, two, three, four, five, six messages from different spirits talking about the idea of beneficence. Others. And then there were spirits, and he, 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 he tells it. He writes the name of the spirit, doesn't write the name of the medium who received the message. And since the message was about mediumship in the beginning here, though I was not uh, really paying attention, but the medium is not the most important. What's important is the message itself. Whatever the name is from the medium or for, from the spirit, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what is the contents of the message. So what Kardec does, and then he puts the name of the spirit. He says, for example, one of these are Jean or Jean uh, was received in Bordeaux, 1861. There's another one from a protector spirit. Doesn't even have a name. It's just a spirit that protected probably the medium that was receiving the message. There's a spirit called Caritas. There was another spirit called St. Vincent of Paul, and another one was Adolf, a bishop of Alger. So he puts the names and he puts the messages, and then we read the message and we interpret it. Tonight's topic, compassion, is there's only one message, and this message was dictated by the spirit of Michel. It was also received in Bordeaux in France in 1862. So there is only one message that talks about compassion, and uh, that's the message we're going to talk about. In this part of the chapter, Kardec, Kardec calls this part of the chapter uh, instruction of instructions of the spirits or the spirits' teachings, because it's not him that's writing anything. It was a medium that received the message from the spirit, and then he writes it and he puts it here. So that's usually how the chapters are divided. We're getting close to the end of this chapter. We still have like three items to the end. But tonight, like I said, we're going to talk about compassion. Before I start, when Nancy sent me the, the list that tonight's he sent me two weeks ago, and I read the title, it said compassion, and she's preparing the, the the topics based on the gospel according to spiritism in English. She's not basing it on Portuguese. When I read it, compassion, I'm familiar, a little bit familiar with this, with this, the, 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 the gospel according to spiritism in Portuguese. I'm going to turn 50 very soon. And I've been reading and participating in activities since I was born. So, I mean, I've heard so many of these titles so many times. But when I read Compassion, it was weird. Because I tried, in my mind, to find this message. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find this message in the Gospel according to Spiritism. In my mind, I'm not saying that I didn't find it in the book. As I read the, the title, it said Confession, and I said, where is it? Where is this message? And then I thought, maybe she copied it wrong. Maybe she saw the word and she put a different title for it. Because I didn't remember. I really didn't remember the message with this title. And then I got the man, got the book, and, uh, and I saw the title, Confession, and said, this is not compassion. 
in Portuguese. My mind was reading the book in Portuguese. My mind was not reading the book in English at that moment. And what amazed me was that I had read this message a lot of times, but I have never replaced the word that is used in Portuguese or in French. And I went to the French version to see what word was used in the French because um, and here I'm going to do another big parenthesis. The book was written in French in 1864, right? Well, in the years prior to 1864 and was uh, released in 1864. So the book was, was written in French. So when we are translating something from one language to the other, of course, we go to the original language. So. To me, it made sense to go back to the, the French. Although it took me some time, and I'm not talking about this week, I'm talking about a few years ago, to realize that when we are translating the book to English, I cannot translate it from Portuguese. I have to translate it also from French. Because if we translate something to one language, then we translate to another language. If we lose from the first to the second, how much are we going to lose from the second to the third? Right? So uh, it took me a little while to really think about this and to really real, to realize that, okay, if we, are, we have to go back to the original language. And that's why there are so many people that have problems with, for example, translations from the Bible. Because it's very, very, very complicated, very complex to translate the Bible. Because the original, the original text from the gospel, right? And I'm talking about Mark, I'm talking about Luke, I'm talking about John, I'm not talking about the Old Testament, but I'm talking about the New Testament. They were supposedly written in Hebrew. However, we don't have the Hebrew from, for those books. We have the Greek for those books. So we kind of lost this first translation to Greek. Although Luke what, probably wrote it in Greek because he knew Greek and he was uh, illiterate in Greek. So he, he is the one that probably wrote in Greek. The other ones, there's controversy around it, but... So, closing the parentheses about this translation thing, when, we, when I came to, to see that the title was Compassion, I thought, okay, so why Compassion? <clears throat> because in Portuguese and in French, the word is not Compassion. It can be used as compassion, but it's not compassion. The word is, it's not, it's not very common in English, so um, at least not for, for us, you know, it come from, from a different language, so it's called uh, piety. See, so it's not very common. We don't use it in a regular language of us that were not born here. So it's kind of hard to to see it, but when we, we hear it in Portuguese or in French, if we are French speakers or Portuguese speakers, we will know right away because the word is piedad. So, but it's funny that the person who translated, instead of translating it to piety, chose to translate it to compassion. And it's always a choice. It's always a choice. To translate is to choose, because you cannot put all the words. You have to choose one word. If the title is one word, you have to title it as one or two words or an expression that is, but you cannot put compassion, piety, and then put like lots of synonyms to the title because it doesn't make sense. So you have to choose one word. So the, the translator of this book, which I didn't even check who it was, but it's right here, Daryl Kimball and Ely Hayes. So two people translated it and revised it. They chose the word compassion. 
And of course, I mean, Darren Kimball is an American, so he knows the words, the word piety. And this was a, uh, um, as far as I can tell, and as far as I talked about with some people, uh, this was not just a person who was, oh, I, let me translate the book. No, it was, he, he was a, he is a professional translator. So he was hired to do a translation. So a professional translator knows about it, knows the words. He has, it's his job. So he knows the words. And for whatever reason, instead of choosing piety, he chose compassion. And then I kept thinking, why? Why did he choose compassion? And it probably was not only because he was being compassionate to us. It was not just because he was using compassion to us. But it was probably, and it is probably because compassion is a word that is more current, that we hear more, that we know a little bit better what compassion is. In that, actually, when you go to the dictionary and you find piety, you will see that there is compassion in the definition of what piety is. So it's a very close synonym. You can replace one with the other and it has both have the same kind of meaning and as i'm reading in english i'm thinking probably in portuguese i don't know if we should but we could replace it with compassion as well and with it would make I wouldn't say that it would make more sense because it's the same it's the same thing in the end but it would make for in our minds because we're so far away from what the meaning of having piety the piedade means then having compassion being compassionate is more close to what we talk than having piety And why? Because for whatever reason, throughout time, when we talk about having piety of another one, it is as if we are having that feeling of, I'm a little superior to the other one. And I have, and even in English, I have pity on you. So it is as if I'm looking down at the person not putting at the same level as compassion is. But piety is the same. It's just that uh, the word itself and what we, we start to understand by it, it changed throughout time. And then we don't, um, we don't have that same feeling or that same understanding or this, that same emotion that when we talk about compassion or being compassionate towards the others. So the message is compassion. And Michel, he writes the following, the very first sentence, he says, compassion is the virtue that brings you closer to the angels. It is the sister of charity which leads you to God. So he starts by saying that is a virtue that brings us close to the angels. What are the angels when we are talking about angels in spiritism? We're talking about spirits, people that were that are already in a state of being a better person, of having a better understanding of life, and of really being there for other people, of to be there to do something for other people. But he also says that compassion is the sister of charity. 
So he will say uh, uh, in a few more sentences that it is almost as if without being compassionate, we cannot be charitable. We cannot be truly charitable. We can give money to someone or can help someone which is always good, but not necessarily I am being really loving. I am really feeling that for the other. I'm just doing to get rid of the person. Person comes and asks for help. And then I don't want to see that person anymore. So I don't feel the person. I just give something to the person so the person goes away. That's not charity in the deepest sense or in a higher sense. That's just, I want to get rid of the person. I don't want the person to be here. I don't feel good with the person. I don't feel. Compassion is what makes charity what charity should be. It is when we touch each other emotionally. When we get in contact with the other person in a deeper level. And when I was writing about, and I was reading about um, the topic or stuff about to, to talk uh, about the, the topic. Um, and then I wrote something to put on the internet so people uh, could read at least a little bit of what I would be talking about. Um, I wrote. I wrote a question because when we talk about compassion, we also think, or when we hear about compassion, we also think about empathy, having empathy with the other person, right? There's sympathy, there's empathy. You know, two different, two different things, right? Empathy is when we kind of understand the feeling, understand what the other person is talking about, understand what the other person is going through. And we tend to uh, have empathy to and relate to that person. But then I found this text written by this guy that I, or this woman, right? Rasmus Hugard. I don't know if it's a, to me it sounds like a, 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 woman, a man's name, but it could be a woman. We never know. Uh, Rasmus Hugard. And he or she goes and he says um, some things that, are, that, are, that were really, really interesting to me. He talks about the difference between empathy and compassion. And he says that having empathy, it is good but it is not the best thing to have. And he, he gives few reasons for it. And he says that the best thing would be, would, would be not to have empathy only, but to have compassion, which are two different things in his personal view. And when you're, we are reading that his text, we understand how his thought process goes. And I'm not going to be able to explain everything of what uh, he says, but I, I wrote like main topics here so that I we can think about the difference between empathy and compassion. Once again, empathy is that idea of, of uh, entering in the same level of the other person and, and feel for the other person. But that's where he says that it stops, and that's the problem with empathy is that empathy is, to make a play with words, is em empathy is kind of empty because it stops there. If you don't, if you go and do something after being, feel the empathy with the other person, then you're not just being empathetic, you're being compassionate. And then he, that he says, Empathy is impulsive. 
when you feel something, if you started to already, when you see something happening, if you started to already develop this empathy in yourself, it will be immediate. It will be something that's really like immediate. You'll feel it and you will enter in contact with the emotion of the other person. But then he says, empathy is impulsive. Compassion is deliberate. Deliberate is I want to do it. It's not something that comes out of nowhere. It's something that I know that I will do. So I have this uh, this image in my mind of one person that one day um, I was reading about this this girl that she had a she had a, a problem or this woman she had a problem and I think she had she was recovering from cancer she was recovering from a big disease that she had and she was at home. And she said that she, what she found, found out, and she was writing about how to help people that are in need of help, in talking about how she was helped when she was in need of help. And she said that there was there were lots of friends, and she doesn't she and she says that in the text. She says, "I'm not talking bad about these friends. I'm just saying what happened." There were a lot, lots of friends that said, hey, called me. They, they called me or they sent me messages and they said, let me know what you need. And if you let me know, I will, I will go there and do it for you. And she said that she received lots of messages like this. But very rarely, those friends actually did something for her. The feeling was good because she knew that they were there for her. But then she would need, she would be the one that would need to call and she would be the one that would need to stay. On the other hand, a few friends, instead of saying, call me when you need something, some of these friends, they told me, I will be free for you at this time and I will make something for you. And I'll bring something for you. What do you want? When is your next appointment in the doctor? What time is it? When is it going to be? So I can free my agenda, my calendar, so I can be there with you. When I'm reading about what this guy wrote, I immediately thought of this example. Empathy is the first the first friends, which feel the pain. They, they are feeling the pain, and there's nothing wrong about it. They are feeling the pain. They are wishing, probably they are sending good prayers, good messages, you know, mentally to her. But they are so busy and they, they, that they felt the pain, but they stopped feeling the pain right there. And there's one thing that this guy says, and that's, one characteristic of what empathy really is, is that usually um, is, and it, it, it goes right into the next point that he makes. And he says that empathy is devising and compassion is unifying. Empathy is devising. Why? Because we tend to think and, and, and uh, feel more for the ones who are close to us. But we don't empathize with people that are kind of far away. And it's unifying the compassion because when I want to do something, it doesn't matter to whom it is. I will go and do it. And it will make me uh, actually feel the pleasure of doing something and not feel the guilt later on of not being able, having been able to help the person. Because of all the things that, that those friends told, told her, oh, I can do it, just let me know. And one day, a person will think about it, will remember that she was sick and say, when did I go there? What did I do? And then they'll say, oh, I didn't do anything. I felt, but I didn't do it. That feeling of emptiness, that feeling of kind of being a, in a depressive mood kicks in. Because we actually didn't do anything. 
we thought we did, but we didn't do it. So um, this idea of, of feeling the pain or dividing the pain is good, but it is just the beginning. And it's not what the message here talks about. The message doesn't talk about empathy. The message talks about what are we doing? And it starts with something, but it has to be active for actually it to, to for it actually to work. We have to go and do it. So he says, and he continues, and he says, empathy is inert. Once again, the same kind of idea. Inert is being stuck, is being there, just like planted and doesn't move. Compassion is active. So I don't offer help in an abstract way. I offer help in a concrete way. I can make, and she uses this, I think she uses this example. I wish I could find that article. It, it really, like, it, po it populates my mind every time I'm thinking about, you know, things or helping people or whatever. I always think about this article, and I wish I could find it. Um, she, she uses the idea, the idea of, hey, I, one of her friends said exactly one of the things that I just said, say, I am going to be able to go with you to the doctor. When is your next appointment? It's Tuesday. I will be there to take you from and bring you back. That's having compassion. Um, or at least a start of, of being compassionate. But it is, it is uh, active. It is something that we do. And she said, you know, uh, one of her friends said, hey, um, you know that I make delicious soups. I'm going to make soup for you. You don't need to worry about your breakfast. I will bring soup to your house. Do you want soup? What type of soup do you want? It's not about do you want soup? Do you call me? Let me know. No, it's about I am doing it for you. If you don't want it, let me know. But I am doing it. I am feeling it. I am. So it's it's taking the step to do it. You know, it's not a word that we uh, we started using a few years, not a few years ago, when I when I came here, we were already using it in, in Brazil. It's like people say, oh, um, oh, let's be active. And we started using the idea of being proactive, right? So it's, it is as if we you know, go before being active, we need to be proactive, we need taking a step to be active. So it's not just waiting for someone to ask. It's coming and doing something. And he finishes this list of four things that he says about comparing and contrasting uh, empathy and compassion. He finishes with this one that says that empathy is draining. And I already talked a little bit about it. Empathy, uh, uh, empathy is draining, while compassion is regenerative. Like I said before, if I say that I'm going to do something or I ask and I don't do anything, I will feel the emptiness of it after because I didn't do anything. Compassion, on the other hand, when I do something, even if it's hard, even if it takes a drain in my body physically, and he even uses the word dopamine, dopamine. The, the dopamine kicks in when we do something good and we feel good after all. Even if I'm tired, I don't feel empty because I was able to accomplish something. I'm talking about a guy that was writing an article, a non-religious article. about business owners that want to do the best for their employees. Everything that he says here 
is inside this message. With different words, with a with a different approach to it. But we can see that what Michel tells us about what compassion is, is the same thing that he says here. I'm going to read one, one other sentence from the, the, the message from the Gospel according to Spiritism and make a comment with what he said. He says, um, when, you're, when you're helping other people, he says, allow your heart, allow your heart, let your heart to move with compassion before the miseries and suffering, sufferings of your fellow being. Allow your heart to feel it. That's the start. Allow the, allow the heart to start. That's the empathy. Then he says, your tears are a balm with which you pour out on their wounds. Your tears, your feelings of sorrow, of, of being there for them, will pour out on their wounds. And then you will manage to restore their hope and resignation. And what delight you will feel. Such happiness, such delight, will, of course, contain a certain, a certain bitterness because I'm only helping someone because the other person is suffering. So I will be a little down. I will be a little because the other person is suffering. So the, the, the more I, the only thing I can do is help the other person a little bit, but the suffering is still there. However, that help, that thing that I do, the tears that I cry over the wounds to help, the, the wound heals, the, the wound heal. Since it does not, the, does not have the accurate taste of the matter, the accurate, accurate is something that, you know, tastes, doesn't taste good, doesn't leave a good taste in the end. That maybe it's good at that one point, but then when you finish eating, it leaves that bad taste in your mouth. So that's what he's talking about. He says that when we are helping another person, since it doesn't have that taste, that bad taste in the end, because you're actually doing something good for the other person, and it doesn't have the other... Um, let me get back here, otherwise I'm... It does not have the accurate taste of worldly delights, and it also doesn't have the pungent, the pungent disappointments of emptiness, like I was saying before. It's not something that's empty of what you're doing. It's something that fills you and fills the other person, so it can help both of us to regrow to regenerate. It's not something that is empty. It's something that helps me and helps the other person. And um, once again, it's not draining. It's regenerative. So he says, um, he, he asks us, never let the world or the things in the world Take that from me. Take that from you. Never let the world take that idea of being there for another person to be extinguished, to be smothered. Try to make this feeling, if not to grow, but to be there the same way. To feel for the other, but not to be to feel and keep away from the other. To feel and go towards the other and walk towards the other. Open up so that we can be, um, be useful. I tend, to, I tend to say sometimes that if we were 
to use. You know when sometimes in this this uh, this uh, last Saturday I was talking here, and I I used the the image of a pen. And um, I don't know if you've seen this before, but you know these you know these types of pens that we can take, and it's just hollow and empty on in, on the inside. And if we uh, if we know how to do it, and I don't advise anybody to do it because you're not nurses or emergency workers, but pens like this already saved people. And you've probably seen that, right? If a person has something that's not allowing them to breathe, and you can you know how to do it, you can open up here and make the person breathe through the pen. Um, but you can also kill a person with a pen. So the pen is a pen. It's not good, it's not bad, right? We use it the way we want to use it. We can hurt people, we can make fun of people, we can destroy a person's, person's life, writing something bad about them. Or we can lift a person up by leaving a good message to that person. So it's up to us what we do with the pen. And even to what we sometimes call bad emotions or bad feelings or bad virtues, we can call it a bad virtue or vice. Um, if we know how to use it, we can turn something that's bad mm, some degree into something good. So I tend to think, for example, about selfishness. Right? Being selfish is doing only for me. Right? So I want it for me. I don't want it for the others. Right. So if I want everything for me in terms of the world. And I want the best for myself. And I learned that by doing good to the others, make me feel better. Why wouldn't I be selfish and do good for the others so that I can feel better every time? So I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to do the best that I can to put more dopamine inside my body by helping the others. So it's using selfishness in a good way. And of course I'm playing with words here, but isn't it the idea that for us to make a, a better world, even if it's not for the others, even if it's for me, if I have everything only for me and I'm walking around and I'm watching stuff and I'm it will, won't it at one point, when I look at that thing and say, man, I, I have so much and the other person has nothing. What will that thing at one point when my conscience hits and how am I going to feel? And every one of us have, you know, has their own difficulties. I have difficulties here, I have difficulties there. The other one doesn't have any here, but has one here. And we are all struggling in one point or, or another. But the more, we, the, the more we think about how much do I have and how much other people have, at least for me, I think about what can I do to diminish this difference, even if it's a little bit, and be there for the other is one of the things that I can do to diminish this thing, is to be close to the other 
so that we can we can not be better than the other when we are offering help. Because this is also a very big problem. Is when we are helping the other person, what is this causing, what is this feeling that I have? That's a, a moment where I will have to think about. And one of the things that he says when the, the, the writer of this text says when he is talking about this is uh, um, why am I doing it? And that self-compassion, the idea of understanding myself and allowing myself uh, space to breathe, space to think about, and then acting. It's an act of knowing yourself. I need to know a little bit about myself for me to really get close to the other. Otherwise, I am not going to get close to the other. I am going to be there as if I'm better than the other and I'm helping the other because I'm better than the other, which is not the idea of compassion. The idea of compassion is being the same as the other. Not better, not worse. Why? Because now I may be in the position of helping. But what about the next minute? Will I be in the position of being helped? And how will I receive help? Because giving help even though it is hard sometimes, is easier than to be in the position of receiving help. Because we tend to feel low when we are receiving help. As if, but should I actually be? Why? And the same thing, should I actually feel better or feel superior when I'm helping? Neither one of the options should be true, but they are. They happen. When we are receiving help, we feel inferior. When we are giving help, we feel superior. And we shouldn't. And if we are still in that conundrum, being superior to the other or inferior to the other, we're still learning. We are still learning to be compassionate. We're still not compassionate because, compa because compassion is not about being better and being able to help. Compassion is about being there. Being there, period. Even when I'm receiving. Because compassion is not about giving. It's about being present with the person. It, and sometimes it's, you know, when, when a person, a friend of ours, or, or um, a loved one is going through something, you know, we had, uh, I don't know, some of us had kids, or, and when they fight, when they fought with a friend, when the relationship ended, the world, like, seems to finish, the world is ending, and you say a few things, but what is that you say that's more important than to than just to be there? And what are you what, what are we actually doing? It's our presence that does something. It's not what we do necessarily. It's not what we give other than our presence or being there for the other person. You know, so um, compassion is this idea of being there. If we think about our angels or our spirit guardians, as we are talking, compassion is the virtue that brings you closer to the angels. What are the what do the do the angels do? Where do our spirit protectors do? They are there for us. Period. <laughs> they don't feel superior to us. Because they are superior, but they don't feel superior. 
because they are our friends. They are there for us. The same way that we have a friend and or someone and that we hopefully will be there for them. But one day it will not be just for the ones that we care. It will be for anyone because we will care for anyone for anything. Compassion is being there, is being present. Is being where it's needed, it's acting, is deliberate, is unifying, is active, and is re is a regenerative, like the words that he used. Uh, this Rasmus Hugard talking about non-religious stuff, non non-religious stuff, using the concept behind the philosophy of religion, behind the philosophy of Buddhism, of uh, of Christianity of all the great philosophies in the world and applying it to be, to make this um, enterprise environment a better place for everybody to, it's our life. Emmanuel says that uh, the temple for God is our life. It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter if it's under a tree, if it's in the nature, if it's where we work, it's everywhere. Because we are there. So to be compassionate is to be present, is to do and feel for the other, but not just feel and stop, feel and act. So uh, if you want to read, I highly recommend reading the message, Compassion, um, uh, chapter 13, item number 17 from the Gospel according to Spiritism dictated by the spirit Michel he talks a little bit more about other topics and about other stuff but um, in more stuff than I, I was able to to explain here to talk about here but it is it is uh, it is a very very good and a very very interesting message and I highly recommend if you are reading in Portuguese to replace the word that we use in Portuguese with the word compassion, because it will make more sense to us, to us, to us modern readers. Maybe in the beginning of the century, of last century, it would make sense to read as piety, because probably the word compassion was not very used. But today we understand more compassion. So item number 17, called apiedade, or in English, compassion. So I highly recommend reading the message and uh, thinking about it. But most important, not not just not just thinking about it, acting on on compassion in our lives. With that being said, I thank you, thank you all for for being here. Um, I told Adriana that she was she was pretty today. And she corrected me. She said, no, I'm, I'm not pretty today. I am pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so be it. Exactly. <laughs> and she is there looking at me. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for being here once again. Um, next month, we'll be back with one more, more topic about the gospel according to spiritism. But we keep following... Um, the gospel according to oh in Portuguese as well. In Portuguese, we also follow the same thing. We follow the order of reading the book. And next week, after I don't know six, seven years, we are restarting the gospel. We finished last week the last message of the book. And then next week we'll be back and uh to to restart the gospel according to spiritism with the very first message of the of the book. Um which is, let me read it in English here, because we're talking in English. Um, it's uh, a message from the spirit of truth. I wanted to see how they translated it. Um, and it's the pre preface. So it's this page. So we're going to be here starting a new, restarting the book in, in Portuguese to go, go through it. And I, to the misfortune of you, I will be back 
<laughs> next week talking in speaking in Portuguese uh, about this the beginning of the book and she asked me to to be here and I said yeah okay if you, if you want to suffer <laughs> it's your problem I mean I'll be here <laughs> um, yeah so uh, we, we are restarting the, the gospel according to spiritism which you know, we always like you see uh, like I said I mean not not an expert I, I've just been, you know, fortunate enough to have been born in a family that's spiritist since I was born. So I've been reading the book for such a long time. Or, um, and today when I read this, I told you in the beginning a story of something that I had never thought about. Every time we read a message, every time we think about it, because of everything that we live, how things change and we change, we read it differently. We read a different book, although we're reading the same book, but it is a different book. So um, hopefully we will learn much more from that, from this new, um, this new reading, this, this new study of the gospel according to spiritism. So you're all invited to, to return and to, uh, study with us and I know that English is not our first language so Portuguese maybe uh, will make a little bit more sense to, to all of us and with that um, Adriana doesn't want to do the prayer I keep asking her but she doesn't want to come here and do the prayer so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let's do our, our, our prayer so that we can finish and thank you for coming, thank you for anyone that's uh, watching us now live or later on. Um, and so with our hearts light from the message that Jesus taught us of being there for others, of taking action when we are in the position and have the opportunity of helping others. We'd like to thank you, Jesus, for the teachings, for the examples, for your life that shows us how we can <coughs> use the gospel, use the message to improve our lives. And by improving our lives, we also understand that it is our duty to help improve the lives of others. So we would like to thank you for all the blessings that we receive that allow us to be ready to help ourselves and to help others. But also, we would like to ask you to put your bomb under our issues and our problems so that we can heal the wounds that we ourselves most of the times cause so that we can keep walking with our head high looking at others and doing the best we can to live a life that leads us to you, to being happier, to being more fulfilled. May your blessings fill our hearts, fill our souls. May your love touch our loved ones, touch the ones that are not so loved, so that we can break barriers and unify and unite because we are all brothers and sisters. So help us with our difficulties in solving problems on the inside and on the outside. May your love be with us here at the Spiritus Center but wherever we walk, may we walk in your footsteps, 
in your footsteps of love and of compassion. Tonight and always, so be it. So, um, thank you once again for being here. We're going to have some classes and uh, we'll be back next week. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.